Welcome to Chapter 3, Homework Questions 29 through 34. Question 29. Rika Shaw is puzzled. She is working with the parallelogram drawn at the right and wants to make it smaller instead of bigger. Part A. What should she do if she wants the sides of her new figure to be half as long as the original sides? What zoom factor should she use? Find the dimensions of the new figure. So if she wants the size to be half as long, then her zoom factor should be 0 0.5. So when you multiply that, it'll be half as long. Um, so the side that corresponds with the 16 should now become an 8, so half, and then half of 11 would be 5.5. So just to kind of give you the idea here, this would be 8, and this side length would become 5.5. Part B, while drawing some other shapes, Ricochet ended up with a shape congruent to the original parallelogram. What is the common ratio between pairs of corresponding sides? So since the shape is congruent to the original parallelogram, then the common ratio between the pair of sides is it's 1 to 1, and the reason is, is because it's congruent. If it's congruent, it's exactly the same shape in terms of the size. Um, in terms of the size, so it's it's there's no zoom factor. The zoom factor is just one. So once again, it's one to one because it is congruent. Question thirty: Enlarge the shape at the right on the graph paper using a zoom factor of two. Then find the perimeter and area of both shapes. What do you notice when you compare the perimeters, and what do you notice when you compare the areas? So let's go ahead and find the perimeter and the area of the original. So if we just add up all the sides, 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3, that's going to be 18 units. And then the area, we can use the formula for a trapezoid. This would be 1 half times the height, which is 4, and then base 1 plus base 2. And so that would give us... Half of 4 is 2, 2 times 9 is 18. And so the perimeter is 18 units and the area is 18 units squared. Now let's go ahead and enlarge the shape on the graph paper using a zoom factor of 2. So each side is going to get multiplied by 2. So I'll just move this down here and we'll go from the corner. And so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this side should be 8. Then we'll go over three units and another three, so that'd be six. And then six, we're going to turn that into 12. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve units. And then we can just connect this right here. And it should be ten units. And we could verify that by making a triangle here, creating a right triangle. Um, if that a top is 6 or 12, then this would have to be 6 and this would have to be 8. And if you use Pythagorean theorem, you would find out that 10 is correct. So now we want to find the perimeter of the new um, figure here. And that would be 12 plus 10 plus 8 plus 6. So let's see, that's 22, 30, it looks like 36 units. And then the area of the new trapezoid would be one half. The height is now eight, base one plus base two. So half of eight is four, and then it looks like we'll have four times 18. Four times 18 would be 72 units squared. And so now it wants to make sure that we do compare the perimeters and the areas. And so you can tell that the perimeter, we, you know, we had a zoom factor of 2. And so the perimeter is twice as large as the, as the original. So the new perimeter is twice as large. And then when you look at the areas, you went from 18 to 72. So it's not twice as large. The area didn't just get twice as big uh, when we had a zoom factor of 2. So... Um, what you can look at is maybe how, how much bigger did it get. You might recognize that it did get four times as big, but it definitely isn't just because we increased everything by two, the area didn't just increase by a factor of two 
Um, in this case, it actually increased by four times as large. All right, so the new perimeter is two times as large as the original, and the new area is four times as large as the original. That's what changes when you take your shape and enlarge it by a zoom factor of two, or at least that's what's happened on this particular one. Question 31, solve each equation below, show all work, and check your answer. On part A, we have 14 over 5 equals x over 3. We can multiply both sides by 3 to get rid of the 3 in the denominator. And then that will give us uh, 13 times 4 divided by 5, and that would be x equals 8.5. And then to check this, we were just going to plug this in. 14 over 5 is equal to 8.4 divided by 3. And so one way we can do this is just change them into decimals. And this would be 2.8. And then take 8.4 and divide that by 3. And you should also get 2.8. So that's how we can check it. Uh, on to part B. Now this one, the variable is in the denominator, but part of that uh, we have to get out so we can multiply both sides by m, and then that'll leave us with 10 is equal to 5m divided by 11, and then now we can multiply both sides by 11. So we get 110 is equal to 5m, divide both sides by 5, and m is equal to 22. And then to check that, same thing, 10 divided by 22 is equal to 5 divided by 11. Take 10 divided by 22, you'll get a decimal approximately 0 0.45. Um, and so this would be approximately the same thing, take 5 divided by 11. And you can check on your calculator that you're still getting that same approximation. And that is true as well. On part C, we have an 8 and a 12. And, and once again, you can do this a couple different ways. Uh, you can do it in one step or, or in two steps where you get rid of the 12 and the 8 all at the same time. Um, it's kind of up to you on how you want to do that. Because it's t minus 2 divided by 12, I'm first going to multiply by just the 12 to get it out of the denominator. And so that's going to cancel and leave me with t minus 2 is equal to, and we can take 7 times 12 and divide that by 8, and that's 10.5. And then if I add 2, that'll give me 12.5. And same thing, plug it back in, 12.5 minus 2 over 12. What is that equal to compared to 7, 8? So 12.5 minus 2 is 10.5, so 10.5 divided by 12 is 0 0.8. 7, 5, and then once again, if you take 7 divided by 8, you get the decimal 0 0.875, so that checks. And then last, we have D. Now there's an X on both sides of the equation, so we got something to look at that's a little different here. 3 and 5, let's go ahead and get rid of the 3 and the 5 all at the same time, and we're going to multiply both sides by that common multiple of 15. So, we got 15 over 1 times x plus 1 over 5 is equal to x over 3 times 15. And we can see that 15 divided by 5 is 3, so this is 3 times the quantity x plus 1. 15 divided by 3 is 5, so that's equal to 5x. So we can go ahead and distribute, subtract 3x, and then divide by 2 and x is equal to 1.5 or 3 halves. And so lastly, once again, make sure we are checking our answers. This would be, I'll change it to 1.5. 1.5 plus 1 over 5 should be equivalent to 1.5 over, uh, what is it, a 3? And so 1.5 plus 1 is 2.5. 2.5 divided by 5, that's half, so that's 0 0.5. And 1.5 divided by 3 is 0 0.5 as well. So that checks as well. Question 32, examine the graph of the line AB below. Find the equation of line AB. We need uh, the y-intercept and the slope. It looks like it crosses the x and the y-axis nicely. So at point B, that looks like the ordered pair 5, 0. And at point A, 
that looks like the ordered pair 0, 3. Um, it does appear that the scale is 1, so they're going up by 1s. So we have the y-intercept. We need to know what the slope is. So if we go and create our slope triangle, that's up 3 and to the left 5, so that's negative. So we do have a negative slope. You can see that by the line going down. So therefore, our equation is y equals the change in y over the change in x, which is 3 over 5, and it's a negative, and then plus our y-intercept of 0, 3. So we get y equals negative 3 fifths x plus 3. Find the area in the perimeter of triangle ABC. So C is at the origin, so I created my slope triangle. I should have created it the other way. That's all right. So here's the triangle that we're looking at. This represents five units. This is three units. So to find the area in the perimeter, I need to find what the um, hypotenuse is because this does create a right triangle. So we can use Pythagorean theorem. We will say 3 squared plus 5 squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. 9 and 25 would be 34. And then we can take the square root of both sides. And then C is approximately... 5.8. So now we know the length of the hypotenuse. We can find the perimeter by adding up all the sides. We have a side of 3 plus 5 plus another side of approximately 5.8. And so our perimeter is approximately, what's that, 13.8 units. Once again, I say approximately because the side length is approximate, so therefore the perimeter is actually approximate as well. Uh, same thing for the area. We have one-half base. We can use the base of 5 times the height of 3. This one we don't need the, the hypotenuse, so this area will be exact. This would be 5 times 3 is 15. Half of 15 uh, would give you 7.5. And then once again, in this one, it's unit squared or squared units. So we found the area and we found the perimeter, but we did have to find the hypotenuse before we did that. On part C... Write an equation of the line through A that is perpendicular to line AB. So we know that the slope of the original line we found to be, uh, where'd it go, negative 3 fifths. Whoops. Okay. The perpendicular slope is opposite reciprocal. So we want it to go and form a right angle. And what we found in previous lessons is that that creates opposite reciprocal. So not only do we take the reciprocal of 3 fifths, which is 5 thirds, we also do the opposite, which from a negative is now a positive. So we want to write an equation of a line with that slope, and it's perpendicular to, um, to that line. And it does, and I'm trying to read that at the, all at the same time, but it does go through A. And A is the y-intercept, so that makes it even nicer. So it's going to go through the y-intercept, and we know our new slope for the perpendicular line would be 5 thirds, so y equals 5 thirds x plus 3. So this is the line that would be perpendicular. So if I did, went up 5 and over 3, and somewhere like this, that's what it would look like, and it would form that right angle there. Question 33, rewrite the statements below into conditional if-then form. So part A, lines with the same slope are parallel. So we would say if the lines have the same slope, then they are parallel. Part B, a vertical line has undefined slope. So if a line is vertical, then the slope is undefined. And the last one, part C, the lines with slopes 2 over 3 and negative 3 over 2 are perpendicular. So the conditional statement, if the lines have slope 2 thirds and negative 3 halves, then they are perpendicular. So those are the three conditional statements for examples A, B, and C. Question 34, examine the diagram below. Name the geometric relationships of the angles below. So on part A, we are looking at angle D. So angle D and angle E. So the lines are not parallel, but we're just naming the relationship. So look at those. Those are inside. Think of in between. They're inside the two, two lines. So we're looking at interior angles. They alternate sides, so those would be our alternate interior angles. 
All right, let's look at B, which would be E and H. So change colors here. E is this angle. H is this one. So this doesn't have to do with the uh, other set of angles. We're looking at angles that are on the opposite sides of two lines that are crossing. So those are vertical angles. All right, C is A and E. So A and E. So there's E. Here's A. Um, they're on the same side of the line that's crossing through the two. Um, one's interior, one's exterior, but look at where they're located. They're both located on the top left corner there, so same location, so therefore those are corresponding angles. And last, C and D. So C and D. And once again, those are not pertaining to the other four angles below. Uh, those are formed by a straight line, so we could call those uh, straight angles. They are also um, supplementary as well. And so those are the different geometric relationships for the angles that you see in question 34.